All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you. Bring my volume down a little bit, please, Warren. Welcome you to the Church of Perpetual Life. Thank you for coming tonight. I'd also like to welcome everyone who is joining us on the live stream all over the country in San Francisco, Chicago, and in New York, and other places around the world. My name is Neil Vandry. I'll be your officiator tonight, and I'm so glad you all showed up. We have about uh, nearly 100 people here tonight, and I don't know how many people yet who are live streaming and joining us as well. Thanks, a big thanks to the AV team, Doug back there, Doug Baldwin and Amy Baum and Warren, Warren Johnson, who's going to be running the cameras tonight. We also have Andrew tonight, a guest photographer, and he's taking some photographs. We thank you for being here, Andrew. We have an event coming up uh, next month. Our event next month is March 23rd. At that event, we have a special treat for you of Charlie Cam coming here from Chicago. And he's here tonight. Charlie, would you let, say hello to everybody for me? That's Charlie. And if you haven't met Rudy, this is uh, Rudy's de debut appearance. Rudy, say hello to everybody, would you? My good friend Rudy, who came, came down from North Florida. <laughs> He's a real quiet guy, very shy, very shy. <laughs> but we're glad to have you coming from North Florida. Charlie flying down from Chicago. Uh, we've got the folks from Naples, the Naples contingents back there. But I think the one who came the farthest is our speaker who came from Venezuela. And I'm so glad he is here tonight. There's a cryonics table on the outer sanctuary. If you are interested in cryonics, be sure to stop at the cryonics table and get some information. We have some information there from the Cryonics Institute, from OSIRIS, which is right here in Miami, and from the Alcor organization. And we welcome it from any cryonic organizations around the world to distribute the information uh, at our cryonics booth. You'll notice that we have a library. The lending library is in the outer sanctuary as well. Feel free to check out a book, bring it away for a month, read it. There's a card in the book. Just put your name on and phone number on that, drop it in the box, and bring it back next time you come. Now, I'd like to know, if I could, by just a poll, how many people heard about this event tonight because you read about it in the newspaper, saw the advertisement in the newspaper? 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, about 14 of you, great. How many people saw it on Facebook or another social media? Facebook, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 9, okay. How many people received an email, saw it, got an email from us? All right, and how many people received a text message or a phone call to remind you tonight? Maybe somebody, heard, you heard it from a friend, okay. Maybe you're just walking along the street and thought, hey, what's going on in that building? Did I miss anything? From? You Googled it. Transhumanist Googling it. Okay, well, glad to have you from, from the Google. <laughs> All right. So, very good. Now, we're going to jump right into the program. I had a, a mini inspirational message, but I'm going to forego that this, uh, this month and, and get into that next month. Uh, if you'd like to know more about our organization, you go to our website, we've got cards out downstairs, where, and certainly talk with me before you leave. Uh, be sure to give us your email address if you haven't already, because we do want to stay in touch with you about future events. We are normally on the fourth Thursday of the month, but sometimes that varies due to different schedules of the speakers and that sort of thing. So be sure to give us that so that we can stay in touch with you. So I'd like to get right to our speaker this evening so we can uh, allow our speakers uh, enough time tonight. Our speaker this evening is a world citizen and our small planet in a big, unknown universe. He was born in Latin America from European parents, was educated in Europe and North America, has worked extensively in Africa and Asia, Europe, and in the Americas. He studied and visited and worked in over 130 countries on five continents. Jose studied at MIT, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he earned his Bachelor of Science degree and Master of Science degrees in mechanical engineering with a minor in economics and languages. His thesis consisted of a dynamic modeling for NASA's Freedom Space Station, which later became the International Space Station. He later studied international economics and comparative politics at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and obtained his Master's of Business Administration at the Institut European de Administration de Affaires in Fontainebleau, France where he majored in finance and globalization. During his studies, he worked with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in Vienna and with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. He started his doctoral, doctoral work at MIT, which he later continued in Tokyo. 
and finally earned a PhD at Universidad Simón Bolívar in Caracas. He's a lifetime member of Sigma Chi and Tau Beta Pi, which are scientific and engineering honor societies here in North America. He's also an honorary member of the Venezuelan Engineers College, and his name has been included in the marquee edition of Who's Who in the World. Jose is chair of the Venezuelan note of the Millennium Project, visiting research fellow at the Institute of Developing Economies in Tokyo, Japan, teaching fellow at Singularity University in Silicon Valley, and he is also an independent consultant, writer, researcher, professor, and timeless traveler. I like timeless instead of tireless. <laughs> Jose is a founder of the World Future Society in Venezuela, a director of the Singular, Single Global Currency Association, and the Lifeboat Foundation. He is co-founder of the Venezuelan Transhumanist Association, board advisor to the Center for Responsible Nanotechnology, committee of the Center for Dissemination of Economic Knowledge, the World Future Society, and the World Future Studies Federation. He's a former director of the World Transhumanist Association, the Extropy Institute, the Club of Rome, and the Association of Venezuel uh, Venezuelan Exporters, where he's participated in the original negotiations of the free trade area of the Americas. Thanks to his extensive work in technolo technological foresight, future studies, globalization, economic integration, long-term development, energy, education, and monetary policy. He has authored over 10 books and co-authored over 20. His first book, El Desafio Latinoamericano, this book was a continental bestseller and used in over 100 universities worldwide. He has an opinion column in the largest and most prestigious Venezuelan general newspaper, El Universal, and has also written and been interviewed by major press media around the world, including ABC, BBC, CNN, which he just did an interview this morning on, I believe, Korean Daily, El Comercio in Ecuador and Peru, El Tiempo in Colombia, and El Universal in Mexico and Venezuela, the Japan Daily News, La Tribune in France, the New York Times, Univision, the Washington Times, and other medias around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Let's give a warm welcome to our speaker this evening, Dr. Jose Cordero. Thank you. Okay, thank you. okay um, yeah. Well, um, good evening. It is a pleasure to be here with you to talk about the future. I have been working uh, with different institutions around the planet on futuristic issues. And um, we are living in the most incredible times in human history. Uh, nothing that has happened so far compares with what we will see in the next few years. In fact, I like to say that in the next 20 years, we are going to see more changes than in the last two thousand years. This is absolutely incredible. In the next two decades, we are going to see more changes than in the last two millennia. One of the institutions I work with is uh, the Millennium Project that began as the, pu the futuristic part of the United Nations University. Even though now it is an independent NGO and we look at long-term trends around the planet. Every year we published a book where we look at the 15 global challenges of humanity and um, this is reported uh, internationally in all languages. Also, I coordinated a book about the future of Latin America. How the region good look in 2030 and uh, four different scenarios. I presented that um, with many different groups and four presidents of Latin America, um, also at the World Economic Forum, Davos, uh, Switzerland, that you might probably know. And I did several TV programs with uh, Nobel Prize uh, laureate uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, and also I was with Donald Trump. Uh, I did two programs with Donald Trump a couple of years ago, so that was very interesting to, to meet the U.S. president today. 
Anyway, uh, the world is, is going through a demographic transition. The population of the planet is stabilizing. If we look at the trends in the next 20 to 30 years, the population of the planet will stabilize, and in fact, it will decline eventually. It is already going down in parts of the world. In Europe, the population is going down. In Japan, Korea, Russia, and other parts of the world. So the population is stabilizing, but the economy is growing exponentially, and this is a truly exciting chart. If you look, it has a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis, which means exponential growth in the economy. The human condition until the year 1800 was poverty, hunger, disease, early death. The average age, life expectancy at the time was less than 30 years. Uh, who has less than 30 years here? Only, only two and a half people. <laughs> Everybody else could be dead on average two centuries ago. So that you see how the world has changed from poverty, disease, into wealth. We are moving into a world of abundance. We say that we are moving from scarcity into abundance. And if you look at the trend for the GDP, um, the gross domestic product, it is still increasing very fast. In fact, the first country that um, doubled its income was the United Kingdom during the Industrial Revolution. And it required 58 years, from 1780 to 1838, to be the first country in human history that doubled its income per capita. After the UK, other countries like the USA did it faster, faster, faster. Today, the world record is China. China, every seven, eight, nine years, doubles its income per capita. And this is truly beautiful. There are no excuses to be poor anymore. We know which things work and which things do not work uh, because we keep on learning from the mistakes in the past. And again, Japan is a very interesting uh, uh, example because it was a very poor country 100 years ago. But because of its focus on technology, and education, it has been growing very fast. And then after Japan, again, other countries, South Korea, China, etc. Um, until the 18th century, if you look century after century, the human condition was poverty, disease, hunger, early death. That was the Malthusian trap. Then the Industrial Revolution began, and uh, humanity has been growing very fast. We could say exponentially. In the 19th century, human um, development, economic development, was close to 100%. In the 20th century, close to 400%. And in this 21st century, probably is going to be 2,000 or 3,000%. We are in an incredible time to be alive. The world is growing, even if sometimes it's hard to believe, but the world as a whole is growing very fast. But there are always people who oppose growth and who oppose development. These are the uh, Amish that probably many of you know. The Amish live like they were living two centuries in the past. And they do not want any technology today. I grew up in South America where we have some Indians who actually uh, live like they used to live 5,000 years ago. They don't want technology. They don't want clothes. They don't want to speak modern languages like the Spanish or Portuguese, nothing. But at least they are more consistent than the Amish because there is nothing special about the 18th century, but they remain in the 18th century. Uh, the Yanomami Indians, at least they have been living always that way for thousands of years. So there will be opposition to many of these changes. In fact, when the wheels were invented probably, you know, there were groups that wanted no wheels. And, and 200 years ago, again, we have the Luddite movement, people who began destroying machines in England. So we are going to have people opposed to all these technologies. In fact, this is an example of a Luddite computer, a new Luddite computer. So anyway, uh, technology is changing, and in order to prepare the world for these changes, a new institution was created in 2009, Singularity University. I am one of the founding faculty, and uh, it, it is incredible what uh, technology is doing to accelerate and improve the human condition. Singularity University uh, actually has the wrong name. 
and not once but twice. First, because it is not a traditional university. It is basically executive education. And second, because it is not about the singularity. But I will tell you what is the singularity. Because the singularity is the most incredible um, thing we are going to see in the next few years. Uh, we expect that by 2045, we will reach the technological singularity, which is the time when artificial intelligence reaches human intelligence. And that will be the end of the human age that we know. So I hope that you do not sleep tonight. The end of the human age. But so that you sleep tomorrow, it will be the beginning of the post-human age, of immortal humans, of incredibly intelligent humans, of incredibly interconnected humans. So uh, we expect that Again, at the latest, by 2045, we will actually become immortal. As you can see the subtitle, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. And for ladies here also, do not worry, ladies will also become immortal. The idea of the singularity uh, was popularized by my friend and boss, Ray Kurzweil, also from MIT, who about 10 years ago wrote his famous book, the Singularity is Near, that is recommended by Bill Gates as the best book of the future of humanity. And then he talks about exponential change and how every two years computers increase their power and their price goes down, down, down. This is basically uh, Moore's law, but it will continue into the future in new incarnations. And if this continues, uh, between 2029 and 2045, we will have computers that have more transistors than we have neurons in our brains. And that will be the time that we reach the technological singularity when artificial intelligence reaches and then surpasses human intelligence. Many people don't believe this, but let me just take you back 30 years into the past. Um, some of you, except those that have less than 30 years, uh, probably remember this, the IBM punch cards. This is basically 10 times 100, which is 1,000, 1K, 1K of memory. I used this when I, when I was at MIT, uh, 1K of memory. But you could not change this, uh, because once you made little holes, you could not change it. Fortunately, uh, electromagnetic memories that could be erased were invented. I have an early example of this. This was also 1K, 1K, but this was much better because this you could erase, and also because it had a bigger hole. But 30 years ago, as I say in Spanish, this was 1K in Spanish, 1K, and this is also 1K. So how much is 1K plus 1K? 1K. One caca of memory. We had one caca of memory 30 years ago. So uh, technology changed, things improved. I have other examples that you might remember as well. This was 512 cacas. This was 1.4 mega. And here I have a pen drive of 128 gigabytes. This has happened in the last 30 years. We went from caca to 128 gigabytes. You will remember me in the next 30 years, and you will remember caca. But this will be caca in 30 years. This will be caca. We will have devices that have more power than your brain in less than 30 years. And this is happening in all technologies, not just with computers. We, has, we have seen this with many other devices, including in biotechnology, and medicine. For that, let me show you my human genome, and I will show you my partial genome, so that you do not know everything about me. But once you sequence your genome with uh, little devices like this, this is a gene chip, a chip to sequence the genome, you will know which diseases you will have in the, in the future according to your genes, okay? So, you will know what you will die of in the future. Isn't this very interesting? But so that you do not die of that, because knowing what you might have in the future, you will be prepared in the future. 
Also, you will discover where you come from. Let me show you my paternal line in the last few centuries. And if you look, my ancestors come from Spain all the way to Central Asia, to Mongolia. And if you look at the bottom right, you will see famous people related to my father like Genghis Khan. So no one should fight here with me. <laughs> now let me show you my mother's line. And then you will see that I descend from Marie Antoinette. I come from a very aristocratic family between Genghis Khan and Marie Antoinette. All of you will know where you come from once you sequence your genome. And you will be able to recreate your genealogical tree. And for the first time, verify if your father is really your father. <laughs> but more interesting than looking into the past is looking into the future. And you are part of the last human generation that has not been designed. All of you are here by mistake. In the future, we will design our children. This is an example of an experiment I did with one of my students sharing genes. This is a theoretical experiment to see how our children would be. And then select the genes that you want. This will be a standard procedure in the next 10 years. We will design our children. And you might think this is very expensive, right? This was incredibly expensive when it began. The Human Genome Project began in 1990, and it took 13 years, and it cost just uh, the U.S. government over $1 billion to sequence the first human genome. I repeat, 13 years and over $1 billion. Today, in 2017, you can sequence your complete genome for about $900 in three days. By 2025, you will sequence your complete genome for $10 in one minute. I want you to look at those numbers from over $1 billion to $10, from 13 years to one minute. That is much more incredible than caca. What is happening in biotechnology is truly, truly surprising. And I repeat, it's happening in all technologies. Because technologies change exponentially, things move faster, they become smaller, cheaper, and better. However, we think linearly, because we evolved in a linear world. And we don't understand the nature of exponential change, but things are changing exponentially now. Let me give you an example between linear change and exponential change, comparing the steps. If I give 30 linear steps, each one of one meter, after 30 steps, I have walked 30 meters. But if I give exponential steps and I double, 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 after 30 doublings, I have walked over one billion meters, and I have gone around planet Earth 26 times. How many of you understand this? We do not understand this well because we think linearly. But I repeat, technology is changing exponentially. So prepare for this exponential world. And this is happening in everything. If we could measure knowledge, how knowledge has been growing exponentially and the time being reduced, there are many, many ways to see that this exponential change is happening everywhere and we are creating more and more knowledge faster and faster and faster. Um, also, we are living longer and longer and longer. Um, the life expectancy has been increasing in the last few decades. And um, as I mentioned before, probably by 2045, we might be able to live indefinitely. Also because we use more time to educate ourselves. We are connecting people, connecting brains, and increasing uh, humanity's knowledge exponentially. To talk about the future, I love Mafalda, the most famous cartoon in Spanish. And um, Mafalda is Argentinian, and like all Argentinians, she knows it all. And if she doesn't know it, she will invent it. So when my father was asked, what is the future? She said, well, the future is no longer what it used to be. Very deep, very Argentinian. 
So actually the future uh, is no longer what it used to be. It is changing exponentially. I like to talk about comparisons. And I compare, for example, uh, the largest company in South America, the Venezuelan oil company, Petróleos de Venezuela, compared to Mickey Mouse. Everybody knows Mickey Mouse here. And Mickey Mouse is an example of the future, mind factoring. And the oil company of Venezuela is an example of the past, uh, manufacturing. So we are moving from the world of manufacturing to the world of mind factoring in all areas. We are using more and more our knowledge, our brain. Uh, futures, we talk about four ways to think into the future. The worst way, which is to be passive, like an ostrich. We hide our heads, we don't want to know what is going to happen, horrible. We suffer the future. It is a little bit better to be reactive, like the firefighter, that we respond, we change when there is a fire. Much better is to be preactive, like when you buy insurance, to be prepared for the future. But the best thing is to be proactive. We can create the future. We can build the future we want. And so this is what we should be doing, to create possible scenarios and go for the best scenarios and avoid the worst scenarios. So I hope we don't have ostriches here because ostriches are not from Florida. But if we have ostriches, they should be technological ostriches that can use technology to see the future. Ten years ago, I went to visit Sir Arthur C. Clarke. And, um, you know, he's very famous for science fiction books and movies like Space Odyssey 2001. But also he's famous because he wrote the three laws of the future half a century ago. And he said, first law of the future, when a famous scientist said that something is possible, he's probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he's probably wrong. Second law of the future, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture past those limits into the impossible. And third law of the future, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So now I want to talk about magic because the technologies of the future will look like magic to us today. 30 years ago, Personal computers were just beginning. When I typed my first thesis at MIT, I used a primitive technology called typewriter. Have you seen typewriters? I used that primitive technology, a caca technology, 30 years ago at MIT. 20 years ago, mobile phones were beginning. 10 years ago, companies like Google, Facebook, um, we're starting and changing the world. So what is going to happen in the next 20, tw uh, 30, 40 years in the future? We are going to see magic, real magic. One of those things is we are going to cure all diseases. We are going to be able to have immortal, ageless cells because we say that aging is a disease, but it is a curable disease. And we expect that aging will be cured in the next two to three decades. One of my friends, uh, Aubrey de Grey, with other people, founded about 10 years ago the Methuselah Foundation. And um, one of their main goals, as you can see through the M Prize, the mouse prize, is to rejuvenate mice and to have them to live uh, indefinitely. In the last 10 years since the foundation began, they have been able to increase the life of mice three times, three times. So they have mice that live almost the equivalent of 300 human years. Uh, for uh, mosquitoes, four times, and for worms, more than six times. This has been done in the last 10 years. So what do you think will be done in the next 10 years? Begin to think exponentially, to imagine wha what will happen. In fact, today we know uh, that there are two type of cells which are basically immortal. The best cells, which are the germinal cells, and the worst cells, which are cancer cells. Germinal cells do not age. They can live indefinitely. Obviously, if they have food and water, and the same with cancer cells. Cancer cells do not age. 
which, which does not mean that they are truly immortal, because if someone kills the cancer cells, they die, but they do not age. So we should be talking about not immortality, but not aging, because even though I do not plan to die, it is not in my plans, and why? Because scientifically, I believe we will cure aging in 20 to 30 years, and we will reverse aging, so I do not plan to die. But that doesn't mean I will be truly immortal, because if a piano falls on my head, I am pianized, even if I do not age. But we will be able to cure aging, because we know it is possible, because it already happens in nature. We are not creating science fiction. Germinal cells do not age, and cancer cells discovered how not to age. Uh, Henrietta Lacks was a patient who died in 1951 in Chicago of cancer. And her tumor is alive today. She died, but her tumor is alive. This is how scientists discovered that cancer cells do not age. These are the most famous cells in all of biology. HeLa cells, because of Henrietta Lacks, they do not age. All over the world, scientists are doing them for experiments. Stopped the aging process. It, it's a mutation that stops aging. We also have some animals who are basically immortal that do not age, like hydras. Hydras do not biologically age. And maybe the Greeks discovered that a few thousand years ago. Also, bacteria do not age. Bacteria are very different from multicellular organisms because they basically have round chromosomes that have no beginning and end. Therefore, they have no telomeres at the ends of the chromosomes. And bacteria basically do not age biologically. And a mother bacteria and a daughter bacteria are biologically the same, except for maybe a mutation that occurred in between. So you cannot tell if there is a mother or a daughter bacteria. So there are many things that are being experimented also because many animals uh, do this naturally. And scientists are beginning to do this and uh, to grow fingers, even to grow some organs. And if you want to do really interesting experiments in China, they are doing uh, head transplants or body transplants. So many things are being experimented in medicine and biology. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in Silicon Valley, they also created the equivalent of a Nobel Prize for longevity, for immortality, which is called the Palo Alto Longevity Prize. And the objective is that, see how far scientists can go into curing aging. And this is a medical doctor who created this prize. Uh, Aubrey de Grey, um, is working on this for uh, over 20 years, and he published his famous book, Ending Aging, and he talks how we will be able to cure aging in the next few decades. And companies like Google created um, three years ago uh, Calico, California Life Company, whose objective is to cure aging. Aging will be cured. Many companies are working on this. Also, Microsoft announced last year that they hope to cure cancer in 10 years, treating cancer as mutations of the equivalent of a digital virus in biology. So I like this, that now medicine is becoming com a computing science. We will be able to cure diseases after sequencing the genome. And then obviously we have Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan, who is a medical doctor. And they announced that they are going to donate all their fortune to cure all diseases, all diseases in this generation, including aging. And they already gave $3 billion for the next 10 years, and they also created a biohub in San Francisco um, that they are already funded with $600 million. And they combined experts from Stanford, Berkeley, and the University of California, San Francisco, to cure all diseases. And the, the, um, I also form part of the International Longevity Alliance where we are working to declare aging as a disease. We need to 
declare officially that aging is a disease so that there is more interest by governments to cure aging. I have done a lot of TV programs uh, with History Channel, Discovery Channel, and CNN in Spanish because that's my mother tongue and I speak it better. And let me show you a two-minute clip, half in Spanish and half in, in English, two minutes, and a little bit of Portuguese. Uh, so let's play that quickly. Uh, which is called Vida Eterna, Immortal Life. Well, you know, the problem is not AI, artificial intelligence. The problem is AV, <laughs> audiovisuals. Yeah, actually some people tell me that they worry about artificial intelligence. I say, no, no, we have to worry first about audiovisuals, and second, we have to worry about human stupidity, <laughs> not artificial intelligence. Anyway, uh, you can watch me on TV, no problem. L let's see if it goes. Last time. It doesn't matter, it is in YouTube. Anyway, and you can see me in person here. Oh, okay. Woo. La búsqueda del secreto para una vida eterna parece llegar a su fin. Los científicos creen que la tecnología ha llevado a la humanidad a prolongar más y más su existencia biológica. ¿Serán estos avances tecnológicos los que logren burlar a la muerte? Desde tiempos inmemoriales sabemos que el ser humano anhela una inmortalidad. Lo importante no es cuántos años vivimos, sino de qué manera los vivimos. Y aquí va a haber una gran confrontación entre las religiones y con la ciencia, al igual que ya ha ocurrido muchas veces. Pensar la vida como algo inmortal es pensar que de algún modo la vida no acabe. La criónica se dedica a congelar pacientes humanos con el objeto de que en el futuro revivirlos y curarlos de la enfermedad de la que murieron. We hope uh, to wake up in the future. That's one of those unknowns, but we just have to try. People in cryonics, I think, tend to be kind of hard-headed people. Uh, we look at this as a rational bet. Nobody knows for sure what the future will bring, but we think there are great reasons for optimism. You know, if you're frozen, you don't know if you will come back. If you're not frozen, you know you will not come back. La medicina desde hace varias décadas busca prolongar la vida. Eso ya tiene efectos. Con respecto al proyecto Avatar 2045, proyecta en un futuro cercano, el 2045 consideramos que en ciencia es muy cercano, poder realizar una descarga de la conciencia en un cuerpo robotizado. Vamos a subir nuestros cerebros a copias de nuestros cuerpos. ¿Será que llegaría algún momento que pediríamos para morir? Es el ciclo de la inmortalidad. Nosotros vamos a ver la muerte de la muerte. Vida Eterna. Estreno. Sábado 4 de mayo. Por History. Um, as I closed that program, I said, we are going to see the death of death. And I am actually working on a book right now with two other scientists, one from England and another one from Korea, about the death of death. This is our objective in the next 20 to 30 years. That is plan A. Plan A is to kill death before it kills us. But uh, for those who happen to die in the next 10, 20 to 30 years, we have plan B, which is cryopreservation. And you probably saw um, uh, David Ettinger, the son of Bob Ettinger, in the video before. And uh, I'm working also on cryonics. I'm starting a foundation in Madrid, Spain, for human cryopreservation. And uh, we have done incredible advances in the last half century since this began. There are many things happening. Um, obviously, I visited Arizona, and then obviously Michigan Cryonics Institute, and uh, cryorus. And let me tell you, China also, I worked on the first cryopreservation of a Spanish person last year. Um, so this is happening very fast because people, 
are beginning to understand that human longevity extension will happen now. And those who die now are really stupid because they are the last human generation to die. We will be able to stop dying, aging in the next 20 to 30 years. So anyway, I was in charge of cryopreserving, in fact, a friend of mine who died of a heart attack at age 50. And this is growing very fast also in Spain. So let me welcome you all to a meeting. I am organizing uh, three days in Madrid, one day in Barcelona and one day in Sevilla. Uh, May 25, 26, 27 in Madrid, and then one day later in Barcelona and one day later in Sevilla. Uh, if you really want to know with the top scientists mostly working on these issues in Europe, uh, we will have also American um, scientists, Argentinian, even Chinese people coming, Australian people. This will be a truly international meeting. Similar to RAD Fest, I hope many of you will come to San Diego uh, in August where we will be talking about all these fantastic developments in RAD, Revolution Against Aging and Death. And I like to say, Viva la Revolución! Yes, revolution. <laughs> because we are very close to killing death if these changes keep on going exponentially. In fact, um, as Goody Allen says, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. <laughs> or what is happening then with all these technologies? The National Science Foundation talks about four key technologies that will change humanity forever. They are nano, bio, info, and cogno. Nanotechnology studies atoms. Biotechnology studies cells. Infotechnology studies bits, bytes, and cogno, neurons. All these technologies are converging in the next 20 years into the technological singularity. The two technologies on top, nano and bio, are the hardware of life, the hardware of life. And the two technologies on the bottom are the software of life. And in the next 20 years, plus or minus, we are going to reach the complexity of the human hardware and the complexity of the human software. And what do you think we will do later? we will improve on the human hardware and on the human software. And this is in the real world, because on top of that, we have the virtual world that is just beginning. We have incredible opportunities in the virtual worlds. This is Microsoft HoloLens that will actually allow you to share virtual reality, sharing augmented reality, virtual reality. But let's go back to the real world. First technology, nanotechnology doing things atom by atom at perfection. Uh, this is an example of a design of a micro engine, the smallest possible engine made at perfection atom by atom. Each little circle is a different type of atoms and this basically rotates and is the smallest possible engine made at perfection. With nanotechnology, there will be no waste anymore because you will only put the atoms that you need. So I like to say that in 20 years, we will no longer use the word waste. There will be no garbage in the future. There will only be raw material in the wrong place. That will be waste. And things, cities, everything will be incredibly clean and incredibly advanced. Second technology, biotechnology, which is living nanotechnology, or natural nanotechnology, if you want. They are related, bio and nano, the hardware of life. There are many experiments now uh, creating new life forms, including transgenic species, like the glow fish that you can buy for $5. These are the zebra fish with the gene of the glowing medusa. And they come in five colors. Uh, based on this, actually, one of my students at Singularity University created glowing plants. And he financed this with Kickstarter in internet. And he was looking for $65,000. And he got, uh, the first week, over $300,000. And in a month, half a million dollars to make glowing plants. Obviously, he was not working just with any plants. He was working with tobacco and marijuana. And you know, those are very popular in California. 
especially if you are already marijuanaized, it's better if you glow. <laughs> Another one of our uh, faculty uh, at Singularity University actually is working on a new technology called the extinction and he plans to bring back the mammoth because now the, the genome of the mammoth has been sequenced and then it can be combined with the genome of an elephant. So we might have mammoths back after thousands of years. Uh, we have cloning, after Dolly, we have basically cloned old animals. This is uh, now relatively simple to do. And many countries are working on this, like in Singapore, they created Biopolis to even clone animals, or in Korea, they clone dogs and cats today. Other countries like Russia as well. But you have to be careful with the Russians because you never know what the Russians think. <laughs> but one of my favorite countries is actually India. And India is very peculiar, very interesting because they have a strange gods to us. They have gods with three heads. They have gods with uh, eight arms, with wings. Uh, with tails. So imagine if you could have three heads. Can you imagine that? One head is working, the other head is sleeping, and the third head is having fun. And you can do it all at the same time. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm telling you this not for you to laugh, but to consider that in different cultures people believe different things. And in India, these are their gods. And if their God can have three heads, why can you not have three heads or eight arms? So think about that because there is a new discipline called synthetic biology. In the year 2000, scientists created the first artificial virus. Viruses are very small and very simple. But this was done in 2000. A few years ago, 2010-11, Craig Venter, who sequenced the human genome, also created the first artificial bacteria. And to prove that he created the bacteria, he included his email in the genome of the bacteria. This is the first bacteria that has no father or mother bacteria, but has email. So how long do you think it will take until we reach the complexity of a human? A human has basically three gigabytes of data. This pen drive has 128 gigabytes. How many humans can I fit here? 128 divided by three? All the lawyers, please. 42.6. Here I can fit the genome of 42 humans and a little cat. So this is the complexity of the human hardware, three gigabytes. Let me move into the complexity of the human software. Let's go fast because we are really walking information, walking information. We know the human genome now, and we will know also the human software. That is moving faster. Everything is also connecting through new generations of mobile telecommunications. In fact, maybe children will be born connected to internet in the future. And we will connect our brains. We will connect our brains. Everything will be connected. The Internet of Things. Most companies uh, are beginning to work on uh, uh, the Internet of Things for cars, for homes, etc. Um, Eric Schmidt from Google Alphabet said in 2013 that by 2020 they could give free Internet to the world by 2020, to the whole planet, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the middle of the South Pole, so that penguins also have free internet everywhere. Actually, later he apologized. He said, it's not going to be in 2020. It's going to be earlier, in one to two years. We are going to have free internet. And it is not just Google that is working with balloons. Also Facebook that is working with drones. And there are three companies working with microsatellites. I don't know if the microsatellites or if the balloons or if the drones will win. I know that in one to two years, we will have free internet in the planet. And this will change the world forever. Everybody will have access to internet continuously for free. 
you will not be able to say anymore, I don't know. In five years, you will not be able to say, I don't know, because you will be able to know if you really want to know. And artificial intelligence is coming and moving very fast. 20 years ago, uh, the blue beat uh, Gary Kasparov, who was the um, chess champion in the planet, and um, IBM later developed Watson that in 2011 beat the humans, uh, and no human now can compete with artificial intelligence in Jeopardy. And finally, a new type of intelligence is developing, uh, like uh, AlphaGo, which is a new type of AI that learns like humans learn by doing. AlphaGo was not programmed like uh, uh, Watson or like Deep Blue. AlphaGo learns by playing, by doing. It's a new type of artificial intelligence, and this is what is coming into the last and most interesting technology, which is cogno technology, cog cognitive science, neuroscience, because the brain is the most complex structure in the human body. It is also the most complex complex structure in the known universe today. We don't know of anything today more complex than the human brain, nothing. Maybe tomorrow we will find some Martians and the Martians have a more complex brain. But until that time, nothing that we know of is more complex than the brain. And you know what? The brain is not that complex. And we will reach the complexity of the brain probably in less than 20 years. So it is really the final frontier, not so much space, but, but understanding the brain today. Um, everything is being connected. Uh, in Japan, they have a plan to create artificial brains and how the brains evolved. Uh, we are very similar to chimpanzees. We are 99% equal to a chimpanzee. And this is not a theory and now sequence the chimpanzee genome and your genome, and you will see that you are 99% equal to the chimpanzee, and about 90% equal to the little mouse. So if we are, if we are 1% above or different from the chimpanzee, can you imagine 1% above us, or 10% above us? This is coming in the next few years. And uh, we used to say that the brain has three major parts, the reptilian primitive brain, the limbic brain, and the neocortex. Now we are building an exocortex, an external brain that will give us super intelligence. Right now, Google, Google says that they want to be the third half of your brain. Think about that, the third half of your brain. And then they will be the fourth half of your brain and the fifth half of your brain. We will increase our brain capabilities. And so let me show you the second number you need to know, which is the complexity of the human software, which is the capability of the brain. The brain has 10 to the 11 neurons. Each neuron has about 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 connections. That makes 10 to the 14 connections or synapses, and each synapse computes at different frequencies. The brain has basically six major frequencies, alpha waves, theta waves, gamma waves, mu waves, which are very slow. The brain is a very slow machine. Brain computes in one hertz, 10 hertz, 100 hertz. A very fast brain, like my brain, is one kilohertz or as I say, one cacahertz. I have a one cacahertz brain. My mobile telephone has a chip of several gigahertz. Gigahertz. This computes millions of times faster than my brain. The difference is that I still have more neurons than my telephone has transistors. But this will change in 20 years. In 20 years, your mobile phone, your computer, will be more powerful than your brain. But again, do not worry, because you will merge with it. You will fuse with the technology. So the most complex structure in the known universe today, which is the human brain, basically computes 10 to the 17 operations per second. And that is if we do not speak about the mind, the spirit, and the soul. 
And I love to talk about the, those, but only after three cups, glasses of red wine. <laughs> you need red wine to talk about the spirit, the mind, and the soul. And that is a complete brain, because there are smaller brains, as you know. <laughs> Scientists are working about connecting brains and transferring information from one brain into another brain. They have done experiments with mice, with monkeys, and you can do this also with humans. Um, I like to show this device, uh, which is basically the beginning of telepathy. Uh, this basically has one sensor, one electrode, that measures what is happening in your brain, in this case in the frontal lob, lobe of your brain, and it has a Bluetooth connection or a Wi-Fi connection that sends this to a computer, a ground connection here as well. And this transfer what is happening in this part of the brain, and it analyzes it. This is the beginning of telepathy. In 20 years, we will communicate telepathically. Talking is a very primitive technology. What we are doing here is very primitive. This is a caca technology. Talking is very slow, very narrow bandwidth, and very inefficient. In the future, this presentation will take one second because it will go from my brain to your brain at fast speed broadband. So this will happen in the next 20 years. We will communicate telepathically at broadband with very fast. And we will merge with the robots with different devices. These are the last 15 years of ASIMO, the robot by Honda. Imagine the next 15 years. In 15, 20 years, the robot will be more sophisticated than you are. And they will have fantastic bodies and capabilities. And they will have feelings. At the MIT Media Lab in my alma mater, they are working on understanding the feelings of robots. And in Korea, in the Congress of Korea, they are discussing a law to give human rights to robots. This has been discussed in the Congress in Seoul, Korea. I don't know what is being discussed now in Washington, but I can tell you that in Korea, they are talking about human rights to robots. And robots will be beautiful, incredibly beautiful. Also for ladies, do not worry. You will have your fantastic macho robot with an additional advantage. They will not get tired at night. <laughs> Unfortunately, we think that robots are bad because of Terminator, who, by the way, spoke at the inauguration of Singularity University in 2009. And he said that he was happy that people were thinking about the future because the science fiction of today is the science reality of tomorrow. And he said that as the governor of California, or as we call him sometimes, the governator. And the governator finished his words with his famous phrase, I'll be back. <laughs> so robots are bad. Female robots are bad. Even when robots have sex, they are bad. But are robots bad or are robots good? It really depends on where you live. If you live in Japan, you actually know that robots are good. One of the most best-selling books in, in, in the last few years in Japan is How to Make Love to a Robot. I think many of you are scared of robots, but in Japan, they want to make love to robots. So don't get so scared about robots, because in Japan, they love robots. In Korea, they like robots. In China, they like robots. And all Japanese companies are working on robots, basically. But this is not robots versus humans. This is humans and robots. And we already saw the first cyborg, human cyborg, in 2012 in London, Oscar Pistorius. And in the World Cup, the football World Cup in Brazil, we had a group of eight paraplegics that used exoskeletons and uh, reading devices 
in their heads like this with a 50 electrode, very sophisticated. And the paraplegics thought about standing up, they stood up and they walked with the exoskeleton. This was done in Brazil in 2014. And last October in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, they had the first cybathlon, the Cyborg Olympic Games. And this is really interesting because people who are disabled become super abled. People who have no legs that have more powerful legs than you do. Eventually, people who have no eyes that have eyes better than your eyes. So these disabled people will become super abled people. And they will have the second Cyber Olympic Games in 2020 again in Zurich, Switzerland. And also the first Robot Olympic Games in Tokyo. Olympic Games only for robots that will soon become more mobile than humans. So one of my favorite uh, professors, Marvin Minsky at MIT, he was asked, will robots inherit the Earth? And he said, yes, but they will be us. We will be them. We will fuse with the technology. All of this is called transhumanism, which is science and technology for transcending human limitations, for improving humans. We humans are not the end of the evolution. We are just the beginning of technological evolution. We evolved up to this point by mistake, by accident, designed evolution. And we are basically trans monkeys. We are post monkeys. And after humans, we keep on changing. We will become more and more, but we have to do it carefully because we do not want to finish like that. So, uh, I don't know if you have read Inferno or seen the movie, because uh, in the book, the bad guys are the transhumanists. Uh, in fact, my institution, one of them, Humanity Plus, we are named in page 292 as the bad guys, which is good because in the Da Vinci Code, the bad guys were the Opus Dei, so to be with the Opus Dei, it, it's pretty good. Anyway, so I recommend that you read the book, not just watch the movie, because in the movie they don't talk about transhumanism, but in, uh, in the movie, in the book, they explain it. Anyway, so um, this is happening. More things are happening um, on technology. And humanity keeps on changing. We keep on evolving. We humans have existed for only 100,000 years in this final version. But we are not the end of evolution. We are just the beginning of conscious evolution. In the next five to 10 years, we will cure paraplegics, tetraplegics. There will be no such diseases like these horrible conditions. Maybe in 20 years, we will have no Parkinson's, we will have no Alzheimer's, we will have no aging. We are going to see the death of death in the next 20 to 30 years. But um, this is not uh, mandatory. I have some friends who say that they want to die. So I tell them, well, if you want to die, no problem, die. And the faster the better so that we can have more for the others. But anyway, this always has the yin and yang, as the Chinese say. And this is so complex that yin yang inside has little yin yang, and even more little, little, little yin yang. So we have to think about the dark side of the force. Uh, and this is the beautiful picture of NASA, of the world at night. The Chinese say, let's light up the world. Do not blame darkness instead light up a candle. So I'm here not to blame darkness, but to try to uh, illuminate the world or light up a candle, as the Chinese say. And look at Korea, a beautiful country that is divided into parts. South Korea, one of the most technologically advanced nations in the planet with the best internet of Asia. And North Korea is still the last planet, I mean the last country in the world 
without internet. And they are the same Koreans, but South Korea goes into the future and North Korea stayed into the past. So we have to meditate. I like to meditate in many ways. We have to really think about the future. And I finish with this beautiful Chinese word, which is very complicated. And I used to write it upside down or sideways. Now I can write it properly. And this Chinese word means crisis. Crisis in Chinese has two characters. The first character means danger, but the second character means opportunity. We are truly living the most incredible times in human history. Nothing compares to what we are going to see in the next 20 years. And there is danger, of course, but there is a greater opportunity. So get ready for the future. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I asked uh, Dr. Cordero if he could uh, answer a few questions. We're going to do just a few minutes of Q&A. Uh, are there any questions for, for the doctor? Question over here. One second, Chuck. What's your name? Okay, Mark. So my question is, what medical technologies are you most excited about ex radical life extension? Okay, I'm going to use a primitive technology to reply. I'm going to use talking, a very primitive. We will not be doing this in 20 years, seriously. Once we communicate faster and in better ways, we will change the world in many ways we cannot even envision today, but technologies. Well, I, I monitor several technologies. One, obviously, is stem cells. Stem cells are a fascinating, incredible technology. And, you know, we didn't know that stem cells existed three decades ago. I mean, isn't this incredible? We didn't know about stem cells about 30 years ago. So to me that is incredible because also we know today that germinal cells and stem cells in a way are immortal cells. They do not age. The stem cells, germinal cells do not age. So I'm very interested in that. I'm also interested in the bad cells that do not age, which is cancer. And that is why I'm so excited that Microsoft said that they will cure cancer in 10 years. You know, it is not a medical doctor, it is Microsoft, because they understand that cancer is a virus, a computer virus in a way, but for biology. So, the good um, immortal cells, the bad immortal cells, two other technologies which I find absolutely fascinating is um, uh, telomeres and telomeras to make the telomeres grow again. And also to understand that bacteria basically don't have telomeres because they have round chromosomes. So understanding biology is very important because uh, bacteria, which are the first real life forms, are basically immortal. Life appeared to live, not to die. And this is a fundamental concept that people have to understand because people say, oh, no, we have to die. That's not true. Life appeared to live, not to die. And that is why the most important type of unicellular part of our body, uh, um, the germinal cells, become from this immortal bacteria. And um, so it, it is important to understand that and to understand the role of the telomeres because that is different from uh, uh, other type of cells. Another thing which is fascinating is regenerative medicine. So we are doing incredible advances in all of this. And, and there are other things, you know. Uh, what I want to say is that in a way, I'm not that worried. Well, I am because we need to accelerate this, but I'm not so worried because as a scientist, as an engineer, I see this as a technical problem. We know it is possible because it already happens in nature. I mean, we are not talking about philosophy or about something impossible. It happens today. How did cancer not how not to age you know it did it and it is stupid Microsoft is not stupid and they said in 10 years they will cure cancer so I'm very excited about this and doctors don't understand this and doctors get very upset when I tell them you know it will not be a medical doctor that will cure cancer it will be a computer scientist 
So anyway, I gave you four different uh, areas which I personally love. Chuck. Hi there. I, I really appreciated this. I enjoyed it tremendously. But there was one part I didn't quite understand. Is when I believe you said that the federal governments would be behind people living much longer in life or being immortal. But I didn't understand why would the federal government be uh, in favor of this. When you, it would lead to, you know, just way too many people on the earth as it is. Well, th this is one thing I don't worry about. Many people say there are too many people in the planet. And I have seven, seven different answers to that, which I'm writing on my book, The Death of Death. One of the easiest and funniest one is I, is I say, well, who really believes there are too many people in the planet? Because if you really believe that, give the example and kill yourself. You know, you cannot ask others to kill themselves or not to have children. If you really believe that, if you are ethically, moral conscious with yourself, you should eliminate yourself. But anyway, uh, you don't have to worry about that because I also talked, which is the most complex structure in the universe? The human brain. So we need more brains. Why has the world advanced so much in the last two centuries? Because we have more brains and more people thinking. People just don't come with a mouth and a behind. They come with a brain. And it is the power of the brain to, to improve and change the world. So, um, well, I can give you more replies, but uh, population has never been a concern to me also because, as I mentioned, the population of the world is stabilizing and decreasing. When I lived three years in Tokyo, the population of Japan went down for half a million. Japan will not exist in a hundred years if the trends of today continued. There would be no people living in Japan. Fortunately, this will not happen because things will radically change in 20 to 30 years, and therefore Japan will not disappear um, from that point of view. Also, the overpopulation issue is so stupid because it could take centuries if it were going to happen. It's not tomorrow that we are going to overpopulate the world, right? It would take centuries for the uh, population to keep on increasing. And in 10 years, we are going to begin colonizing Mars and then other planets. Uh, so the universe is huge. We live in a tiny planet, in a tiny solar system, in a tiny galaxy, in a huge unknown universe full of resources. So I think we have the whole universe to explore. We truly live in incredible times. NASA just announced yesterday, as you probably know, that they discovered this uh, a star, which is about 40 years, uh, light years away from planet Earth, that has seven exoplanets, three of which are relatively similar to Earth, and also in the um, living zone uh, for planets. So I, I think we might find other life forms in the universe soon, in 20 to 30 years. I, we truly live in incredible times. We are discovering the universe. It's a beautiful time to be alive. And it will only get better, you know? This will only get better. This is like love, you know? <laughs> uh, you have to tell your, your partner or whoever, I love you so much more than yesterday, but less than tomorrow. <laughs> Rudy. Yes, thank you, Jose. Uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, I think most many of us would agree with every single thing you said. Uh, my question, well, first of all, let me thank you for the, your support and shout out for Quranix, which, by the way, is typically affordable through life insurance. Uh, and also, but to ask the question, as, the trans, as these transitions occur, obviously there's going to be a great deal of pushback from a lot of different sources. Do you think... Like that, the Amish? Yes, there may be. What do you anticipate? Do you anticipate literally violent revolutions? What, what kind of level of violence or extremity do you... Ex do you anticipate as these revolutions occur? Yeah, it is a big concern, not just uh, a concern to me. People like Stephen Hawkins and um, Elon Musk say that we actually have to colonize Mars soon because we can destroy ourselves on planet Earth. So there are some serious concerns. We have so much technology that we could destroy human life or even worse, all of life on this planet. That would be horrible. Uh, of course. So um, I, I am concerned about this, but some cultures are more open. 
And that is why I love uh, East Asia. In East Asia, they are much more tolerant for one thing. Also, they believe in multiple gods or in no gods. It is not like there is only one god and it is my god. It happens to be my god, you know. So religion is a problem, I find. Also, well, we are in a church. I, I, I shouldn't be <laughs> talking too much about religion. But there is something very interesting. We are going to see, as I mentioned, the death of death. And most religions live out of fear of death. And they explain what happens when you die. But what would religions explain if you do not die? So it's a very complicated issue. Uh, so there will be opposition from that and some cultures. The Amish, as I mentioned, they lived 200 years in the past, which is really stupid. Or the or the Yanomami Indians in South America, they are living like uh, 5,000 years ago. Some parts of humanity might stay behind. Like maybe when we separated from our previous uh, simian ancestors, because we, from other monkeys, we evolved. But that was by accident. We didn't evolve by design from the monkeys. We just were an accident. But now we will do it by design, and I think we will do it better. Um, and some cultures are, are getting ready for that. I truly think Japan, Korea are looking into the future, into transcending human limitations, and that is why the Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2020 will be so important as well, because we will have a robot Olympic Games and also the Olympic Games in Zurich, the Cyborg Olympic Games. This will also change people's perception from being disabled to being super able to becoming transhuman to becoming post-human. It really is fascinating, and I hope people don't die, but if they die, plan B, cryonics. <laughs> I have a question back here, Dr. Cordero. David? So, someone you know, famous, has gave a quote many years ago, the business of life is death. What do you think that person meant, and any comment about it? Um, well, as I explained, in, uh, in a different way, the purpose of life is life. Life appeared to live, not to die. So I would disagree in a way with that statement. Uh, but obviously there are many interests, um, vested interests in the past. And some of these groups, companies, maybe even nations, would oppose some of these uh, new changes. Uh, and this is a real fear. Um, that I have, as, as Stephen Hawkins has. But anyway, uh, we have to be optimistic. And this is one thing that Sir Arthur C. Clarke told me. We have to be optimistic because many of these things end up being self-fulfilling prophecies. If we believe that we will kill ourselves, we will probably do it. But if we believe that we will transcend, that we will evolve, that we will colonize the universe, we will probably do it. Also, Henry Ford said, if you believe you can do it, or if you believe you cannot do it, in both cases, you are right. So I think we need to believe that we can do it and that we can improve the world in order for it to happen. So we have to be positive, we have to believe that the purpose of life is more life, better life, healthier life, more intelligent life, and once again, do not be afraid of artificial intelligence. Be afraid of human stupidity. And that is very natural. Human stupidity comes natural. You don't have to add anything. It comes naturally. But artificial intelligence, how can anyone be afraid of being more intelligent? You know, how can you be afraid? Do you want your children to be more intelligent or more stupid? Do you want your children or you, you want to be with intelligent people or with stupid people? You know, I think we want to be more intelligent. We want to improve our intelligence. So when Google said that they want to be the third half of your brain, I say, fantastic, but on, not only a third half. I want a brain which is a million times better, faster, more connected. Uh, so please, Think big, think that we can do incredible things. 
In 10 years, we will begin to colonize Mars. Isn't this incredible? Imagine when the first humans left Africa, I don't know, 60, 70,000 years ago, or when the Europeans left Europe and came to the Americas. Those were magical times. We are going to see this kind of magic in the next 10 years when we begin colonizing Mars. So get ready for a fantastic, fast, beautiful future. Question from Dr. Leonardo. I have a simple question for you, and I am just a mediocre medical doctor. And to me, you are a genius. And I have just only one question. Were you born in this planet, or do you come from another galaxy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we live in a small planet, in a small solar system, in a small galaxy, in a big, huge, beautiful, unknown universe. But yes, I was born here. <laughs> one, <laughs> yes, uh, just one quick question. Uh, you keep talking about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I've been in the high tech business a long time. And it, you, why is it take, taking so long? The technology, you already said there's 40 people on that one little uh, drive you had. What is taking it so long to get where we want to go? Because 10, 20, 30 years is too long. Any uh, feedback on that? Um, yeah, actually some technologies are developing faster than expected. Oh. Even internet. Very few people saw internet coming. Uh, when I was at MIT, I used a typewriter, you know. I could not imagine internet at the time. And now I cannot live without internet. So some things are moving faster than others. Um, one that is very slow is flying cars. Even though we will have flying taxis in Dubai in July, they are beginning with an experiment of flying taxis in Dubai. Anyway, um, for this to happen faster, I think people need to realize that this is possible. Uh, to me, it is surprising, as I mentioned, that this woman in Chicago, Henrietta Lacks, died in 1951, and then it was understood that cancer cells do not age. And how many people know that cancer cells do not age? Almost no one knows it. Even today, I find that appalling. How, how this is not better understood by people? And the HeLa, Henrietta Lacks cells, are the most famous cells in biology. And uh, let me ask you, really, how many of you knew before that cancer cells are immortal? We are in a very sophisticated audience here. This is not the case outside, you know. Even 1% of the people, it's a lot of people that know that, and because they know maybe someone with cancer, and then the doctor explained that to them. So anyway, the more that people know about this, and that is also why in your question, I'm not concerned about the technologies, because I see many promising technologies coming. And as an engineer, this is a technical problem. And the fact that it is possible is that it already happens. It happens in this nature. So what I would like is for more people to understand that this will be possible. And that we are in between the last human mortal generation and the first immortal generation. The more people understand this, the better it will be, the faster it will be, the more research it will be. So we need to popularize these ideas. That is why I am organizing this event in Madrid, in Spain, with the Secretary of Health of Spain and with, with the Doctor of the King of Spain. You know, I want the Doctor of the King of Spain to fully understand that we might be able to cure aging very soon. And that therefore, they need to invest uh, and, and even people like us, you know, we need to transmit these ideas. You are truly a very unique group of people because close to half of you knew that cancer cells are immortal. And as I repeat, in the average population, 1% is too many. So uh, explain this to others. Teach them. Tell them that they are stupid if they die because we should be able to cure aging very soon. A question from Ellis back here. Yes, um, doctor, my name is Ellis Vaughn. I think it was a fascinating presentation. 
and obviously something probably that a lot of us have thought about, and the older we become, um, the more we think about it. I've always thought of myself as a relatively young man, but a few days ago turned 75, and joked with my people and said, I'm 75 and still alive, I'm fortunate. When I was young, uh, 75 was considered pretty old. But the point is, there's a saying, a young man thinks he shall never die. I mean, I remember being 18, 19, 25, full of life, and even into my 20s and 30s, and life just seemed to be forever because there were 50 or 60 or 70 years in front of me. So the question, sir, is how does this process of aging that we all go through in this room fit into the concept of it will never stop for us? Could you please explain that some? Um. Well, I, I think it will stop for us. I'm working to bring that stop to the aging process. Uh, I, I, I think it is possible. Uh, the more people that uh, ask about this to politicians or if you invest in companies doing this, we can stop it. I get so excited when uh, Mark Zuckerberg said that he's going to cure all diseases when Microsoft announces that they're going to cure cancer. Um, I think we can stop the aging process. As, and as I said, also we have to mentally prepare ourselves for that. And therefore, I openly say all the time, I do not plan to die. Good. <laughs> really, we have to and not only think about it, but also work towards it. Um, obviously, maybe I do it more now because obviously I'm beginning to feel older. And let me congratulate you if you are 75 because you do not look 75. Huh? You look like about 50. Uh, so fantastic age, condition, your voice, your energy, uh, your knowledge. So congratulations about that. So uh, stay alive for 20 years more. You know, actually Ray Kurzweil, my friend, he says that in about a decade, we will reach longevity so that the, for every year you live by the late 2020s, you will live a year longer. So we are almost hitting that point, the Methuselarity. You probably have heard about that also, the Methuselarity, the Methuselah singularity, longevity escape velocity. And we are close to that. Uh, in a decade, for every year you live, you will live one more year. And then again, we should be able to rejuvenate people. Uh, so I think it is possible. I think it's going to happen. I'm working towards that. I hope all of you are doing that too. That is why you are here on a Thursday evening. I have a question here from Paul. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting, exciting presentation. And um, you made a very good case for how radical and enormous these changes and technological developments could be. But I'm really struck by the kind of relentlessly positive cheerleading tone <laughs> of the presentation. Whenever something on that kind of scale can happen at such a quick period of time, the potential for dangers for things that we don't understand. We are, after all, the product of an enormous amount of testing by evolution. Uh, so that we have arrived at a certain kind of equilibrium. Why was there not more emphasis about the potential downsides or the dangers that await us? Well, I did talk about it, about the yin and yang. I talked about North Korea versus South Korea. I talked a little bit about meditation. I am aware of the problems. But also, as I try to convey, these are things we create and we begin by imagining them. Uh, if we don't think, if we're not excited about the future, if we don't think we can live longer, better lives, then it will not happen. And I am always so excited to be alive, to be with friends, wonderful people like you, to learn more. I am truly waiting to go to Mars, not in the first trip. <laughs> But I'm looking forward to that. So we have to be excited. Oh, this is fantastic. It is the best time to be alive. It's the first time we can truly, scientifically, believe that we will stop aging and rejuvenate people. This possibility was never 
a reality or even a dream before. So how can I not be excited? And I want to be excited also, so no problem. <laughs> we have time for one more question here on the floor, but know that uh, you'll be able to ask Dr. Cordero questions downstairs afterwards. Yes. Thank you. Well, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one um, is related also to, let's uh, put it the way, uh, the more uh, real side of the economy and the wealth creation process. Um, in business, for every new business that you create, um, one is, is going out of business. So here you are creating a lot of wealth, a lot of new possibilities, but you are also destroying. It is the creative destruction uh, of value that Joseph Schumpeter talked about in economics, right? So what are the negative consequences on the uh, uh, value and the uh, uh, world uh, that is created nowadays. A lot of businesses probably will go out of business with these sort of new technologies, right? And h how are you thinking about that process? The second question it is, uh, how long I still have to wait until uh, I have the access to technology so that I can remain like looking 35? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's begin with the second question. Um, when technologies begin, they are very expensive and they are very bad. You all remember the first mobile phones? Incredibly expensive, incredibly bad, and they only did one thing, more or less, to make phone calls. Today, everybody, everywhere, anywhere, has a mobile phone, even in Africa, in India, in Pakistan, everybody has access to a mobile phone. And this has happened in two decades. And the mo mobile phones of today are incredible computers that do multiple things compared to the telephones of 20 years ago. So, the same with the human genome. I talk about the human genome, over $1 billion and 13 years, Soon it will be $10 one minute. Everybody, everywhere, anywhere will sequence their human genome. So, again, technologies begin very expensive and very bad. When they democratize, when they massify, they become very cheap and very good. So, the first longevity treatments might be very expensive. But very soon, and I don't know how soon, maybe in months, because this is moving so fast. Maybe in months, it will be incredibly cheap. Also, why this will be cheap is because we are cheap. We don't cost $100 in raw materials. You probably know we are 70% water, and we are not Evian water, Perrier water. <laughs> we are tap water. <laughs> we are actually water bags. This is what we are. Water bags, very cheap. So to maintain something that is cheap will be cheap once we know how to do it. The thing is we don't know how to do it yet, but we are learning. So, so that was the second question. The first question, uh, somehow also related to, to the previous one, we are moving from a world of a scarcity into a world of abundance which is also hard to understand because economics, traditional economics, is based on scarcity. But uh, incredible technologies like robotics, 3D printing, nanotechnology, uh, will change the world radically. With nanotechnology, we expect to create one kilogram of anything for about one dollar. You will be able to have breakfast, one kilogram of caviar for one dollar. It is hard to understand, but why will it be that way? Because it is the way we arrange the atoms, and nanotechnology will make us to arrange anything very cheaply. So we're moving truly from scarcity into abundance, and then the economic model will be very different in the future. Um, if you look at the trends, as I mentioned, we are becoming wealthier and wealthier in overall terms, and also things are becoming cheaper and cheaper. No king had the standard of living that we do today, you know, even a century ago. So this is becoming also massified, the higher standard of living. Um, it really is incredible. And it will only get better, like love. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Lu Thank Jose you. Luis Cordero. Thank you, Dr.
So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you someone who has made this evening possible by making the Church of Perpetual Life possible. The founder of the Church of Perpetual Life, let's welcome Mr. Bill Falloon. Thank you, Neil. You know, some of you are going to know the answer to this question, but there was a factor in what Jose talked about that frightens me more than anything else. And what frightens me more is that I may not live long enough to take advantage of what I consider to be an absolute inevitable evolution into the world of physical immortality. Human immortality, I believe, will happen. What I don't know, will I live long enough to make it happen? What I'm gonna do is just go through a couple slides to give you kind of a news update about what's going on. I started the idea of trying to live forever in my own mind, in my own world in the late 1960s. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of people interested in that. And I would give lectures, I would write articles. The response was virtually zero. But recently, the media has been picking up on the idea that technology is moving ahead at such an accelerated rate that human beings may no longer face inevitable illness and death. It may no longer be inevitable in the not too distant future. Just a couple days ago, The Atlantic Magazine published an article about a person who's going around the country. He is promoting the idea of putting more resources into the technology so that everyone in this room and everyone in this world who wants it can achieve these incredibly healthy, long life free of degenerative illness and free of the horrific consequences of a finite lifespan. We're looking for indefinitely extended, healthy human longevity. And the media, the scientific community, the academic community, they're starting to recognize it. They're starting to recognize the fact that people are only facing death now because we're not living in the future. So what scares me is I was born a little bit too soon. If I was born a little bit later, I'd be able to take advantage of everything that Jose has just described to you tonight. Now, up, up on the screen, you saw a book with a, a prophet, prophet of this church, Nikolai Fedorov. He was alive, he died, by the way, in 1903. But during the 1800s, he made a number of predictions. The one that he emphasized the most was that technology could evolve to eradicate famine. And for those who don't understand, up until recently, people starved to death or they died of micronutrient deficiencies. I don't know how many people in this room have heard of the disease called pellagra. Okay, some of you do, I guess, smart audience. Well, 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 that's a vitamin B3 deficiency. And that used to cripple, kill people. Beriberi caused by B1 deficiency, and of course, scurvy caused by lack of vitamin C. People were dying from those diseases along with just no food, no food. And Nikolai Fedorov said, if you put in money and, and, and knowledge into technology, people won't starve to death anymore. Nikolai Fedorov also predicted, put enough investment into technology, people will no longer age, they will no longer die. So this church was founded back in November 2013 on the premise that we've got a prophet who's got a rather good track record. If you read his book, he makes all kind of predictions of what was going to happen, and it's already pretty much happened today. Now, we need to control biological aging right now, and we need to reverse it because the technology that Jose talked about may be 20 years away, might be 30 years away. We need to be alive in order to take advantage of that, unless we're cryopreserved, and then we may also be able to take advantage of that. But the good news is scientists around the world are putting in considerable resources to gain control over degenerative aging processes. Jonas Salk, 
a true pioneer, someone who we should have a pedestal in his church to honor because he broke a lot of rules in order to accelerate the development of the polio vaccine. He pushed that forward and he eradicated polio. An institute that he founded is still doing some incredible research and they're now focusing on age reversal technology. The media reported just a couple months ago on some breakthroughs that they're making in their laboratory to reverse biological aging. This is incredible. Uh, the Guardian, we just picked up this news uh, piece, by the way, a couple days ago. They're reporting on what's going on at Stanford where they're looking to find a way to cure Alzheimer's disease using young plasma constituents, putting concentrated plasma proteins into older demented people to restore their neurological function. And that process is moving forward very rapidly. It's an incredible technology. We've talked a lot about it at this church. The idea of using stem cell mobilized young plasma to put into older people to rejuvenate them. This technology may occur within the next year or two. It's not that far in the future. And if this technology works, it means people who think, I'm not gonna live long enough to enjoy all the incredible benefits that Jose talked about, guess what? We may be able to do it. Now this is a study that was funded initially by an organization that I founded, and it's really interesting. We put up the initial money, and then the Calico people at Google, they picked it up, and they worked with Aubrey de Grey at SENS to fund this study. But what's interesting is they took just a single transfusion of young blood into older animals. They, don't, they, just, they just did it one time and they were able to observe some interesting age reversal benefits. Now the protocols that we're working on right now call for older people to go into a doctor's office once a month and have stem cell mobilized plasma proteins put into their body. We believe that may reverse biological aging and most if not all of the degenerative illnesses that accompany biological aging. So again, the media is picking up on it. This is a peer-reviewed published study, by the way, came out in November 2016, but we may only be a few decades away from eradicating illness, getting rid of it. And as Jose talked about, the Zuckerbergs, these are multi-billionaires. They have committed themselves to eradicating every single disease that afflicts mankind, including aging. Now these are young, wealthy people who are able to see the future far better than their, let's say their peers of 50 years ago where aging was just considered an inevitable consequence of growing old. You, you, you grew old, you got sick and you died. Well, these young individuals from Silicon Valley, it's not just the Zuckerbergs I put on many slides in the past showing that the people who had the foresight to set up something like Facebook and Google and Amazon, they're all putting big money into age reversal technologies because they see it as clearly a reality as they did with the businesses that they made so successful. Just a week ago, I talked to an individual who started this institute. He's, he's out of Austin, Texas. His motivation is to reverse aging. He's got a genetic defect that causes him to age in an accelerated way. He's 43 years of age, and he has committed himself to finding a way to reverse the aging process, not just of himself, but of his family members who are also accelerating their aging process through a genetic defect that he hopes to correct. So he is going to hopefully partner with a number of organizations that we're working with to find a cure for biological aging. This is what we're moving towards. And Zoltan uh, Isdoff, he was here at this church a year or two ago with his immortality bus. And he made the front cover, or at least part of the New York Times Magazine on Sunday, February 9th. And it got a lot of nice publicity. But he is going around the country, pretty much doing what Jose is doing, talking about the fact that we're only a couple decades away from not having to fall ill, from not having to die. He's talking about living for an indefinite period of time. So the media is picking up on this in a way that it's not just a fad, because once people start living longer, start living healthier, start seeing their degenerative illnesses go in reverse, they're going to want more. They're not going to say, okay, I'm 95 and healthy, that's good enough. 
No, 95 and youthful and healthy, you want to keep going, or at least for the most part, you're going to keep going. And the great news is the media is picking up on this, as are the billionaires who had the foresight to set up Google and Facebook and Amazon and numerous other companies, numerous other situations. But again, what's frightening is missing the longevity boat. This individual, you see his commercials run endlessly on TV. Ed Morse owns car dealerships around the state of Florida, throughout part of the southeastern United States. Net worth, $1.6 billion. His car dealerships, by the way, they're doing great. In fact, I see it every morning. That's my Toyota. I bought it from Ed Morse Toyota. Got real good service there, by the way. But the problem is, Ed Morse, he's not around anymore. His money is, and we don't know what he may have done from a charitable standpoint. A lot of these wealthy people are very generous. They, they give money to charities, but they don't strategically investigate where they can place money that could save their own lives. And as a result, at a young age of 66, he deanimated. He died. He's no longer around. All that money, and yet Ed Morse, while his commercials may go on forever, Ed Morse himself will not. He did not take the initiative that we are advocating everyone who has more money than what they need to survive on in today's world, put a little bit of it, put a little bit into research that we've identified that may enable them to grow biologically younger and eradicate their degenerative illness. I do have a, an incredible collection, by the way, of these slides, but I'm just going to show you the most recent one. This is the most recent multi-billionaire who died, and in his case, it's rather interesting. He was ill for about 20 years. He had coronary bypass surgery in 1998. About a decade later, he needed bypass surgery again. He developed multiple degenerative illnesses. And like most billionaires, he gave money away here and there. That's great. But instead of focusing on the fact that he was growing old rather rapidly and he was suffering the horrific consequences of coronary artery disease, possibly malignancies, just a number of degenerative conditions, with all that money, he didn't strategically use it to save his own life and the life of his fellow humans. And to put in perspective the kind of money that some of these very wealthy people have and, and they're not spending it efficiently. A year before he died, he was only worth $4.8 billion. That's all he was worth, $4.8 billion. In that last agonizing year of his life, his net worth jumps by $600 million. These individuals, you see, own businesses. They keep making more money. While they're growing older, their money keeps piling up. So in his last year of life, Instead of thinking, maybe I should spend some of the surplus money I'm making to stay alive, from what I understand, he just wrote checks to the typical charities who typically do very little to accomplish the objectives that this church was established to, to accomplish. So this individual, the owner of the Detroit Tigers, he's the founder of Little Caesars Pizza, uh, he owned multiple businesses. He's an incredibly successful businessman, yet he did not strategically contribute to what we feel is the ultimate way to spend money when you have got more money than what you need to live on. He didn't use his money to save his own life. So one of our missions that we are working on now on a daily basis is to convince people who have a lot of money, put a tiny fraction of it, a very, very tiny fraction of it into a pool so that we can use that money to fund right now about six or seven researchers who we believe can reverse biological aging right now. Proof of concept studies in human beings have validated that what they're doing will probably work. We just need to fund some clinical trials for a very small amount of money, a very small amount of money, and those clinical trials could yield validated ways for everyone in this room to grow biologically younger. 
which is the mission that this church was established to accomplish. So I want to thank everyone for attending this event. Uh, this has been a very nice turnout, by the way. And uh, Jose, I cannot thank you enough for that lecture. This is going to be, by the way, this has been taped, and it's going to be on the church's website because I'm going to let a lot of people know they need to hear that presentation that you just heard because, to me, that was the best that I have ever uh, witnessed about how we are going to live as human beings a lot longer and then transform ourselves into superhumans. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked if uh, Bill could do a few uh, questions uh, multiple times. Tonight we're going to give him that opportunity. So we're going to take just a short Q&A with uh, Mr. Falloon. Are there any questions for Bill? Back here. And I'll come there next. Bill, that monthly uh, visit to the doctor for the stem uh, stelt, is that available now? As far as, uh, just turn the mic, please, yes. Um, the stem cell mobilized plasma transfer, that is moving forward, and probably every day some step is taken. The, the impediment, and I'll answer that question, by the way, that was posed to, to Jose. The, the impediment really is the regulatory structure in this country. We have an FDA, we have an IRS, we have an SEC, we have an FTC. We've got so many regulatory bodies in this country that are impeding the progress of biomedical technology. That is the major roadblock, by the way. It's not technical. It is the fact that almost anything you do that's novel falls under the purview of some regulatory agency. And if you don't do everything right, you can find yourself out of business or in jail. So that is the real dilemma that we have to overcome. And we are working on ways to overcome that type of obstacle. But the good news is we are moving forward. We expect to file an IND, Investigational New Drug Application, with the FDA within the next couple weeks so that the study can initiate in the United States if we raise funding, or we may be able to do the study in Nassau, Bahamas, in a way that people can self-fund the study. Uh, in other words, participate, pay some of the cost, and derive the benefit. So we are moving forward with every single age reversal technology that I've talked about in this church over the last couple of years. Every one of those projects is moving forward. We haven't had anything that would indicate that these technologies will not reverse aging. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we're medical doctors, regenerative physicians, and we've been asked by a lot of people here tonight, what should they be taking to enhance their own longevity? And I told them that there was a little organization called the Life Extension Foundation that they had not ever heard of, that is local, that I know you're familiar with, that they could just go on that website and learn more about the types of things that would be good for them if they want to try to live forever. That's just a comment. The question is, what do you think the, the new administration, particularly Tom Price, is going to do with respect to um, allowing um, more stem cell medicine and other research to go forward without the incredible billion dollar cost, uh, price tags that we've had uh, until now? Well, here's what we're hoping is going to happen. Uh, Peter Thiel uh, was very close to the current President Trump. And I don't know how much influence he has, but one of Peter Thiel's primary objectives was to get a libertarian-minded commissioner appointed to the FDA who would pretty much ignore a lot of the current restrictions on biomedical research. Just let it go forward and see what happens. So there is, I guess, at this point, maybe a 50-50 chance that a hardcore, pretty much hardcore libertarian may become the new FDA commissioner. If that happens, we may see an explosion as far as the acceleration of technologies that could save everyone's life on this planet. Uh, so there might be some good news or there might not be. We haven't heard it yet. But again, the bureaucratic obstacles are what is keeping the technology from accelerating. And there might be some good news. We certainly will announce it. Yes, we're hoping so. Questions for Bill? Back here. Hi, <clears throat> Hi Bill. I know you. I've seen you a couple of times. And it's always a pleasure to see you. This is a fascinating subject. Uh, and I've been thinking about it a lot lately, like some of these people have. I will, I'll tell you a couple of interesting stories. I was the congressional representative to Congressman Claude Pepper. 
He was a senator for 16 years, a congressman for 23. He authored 11 of the 12 National Institutes of Health. He and his wife both died of cancer. Uh, but when I was in his office one day, and this was some time ago, because it was when I was in my 20s, a man came into his office and I got all kinds of people in the office when you in some place like that, and he said, I want you to find me a young man that I can buy his blood and transfer his blood into my body so that I can live longer. I mean, not all of it, but some of it, you know, work out some kind of project with him. Uh, and an interesting, interesting story that, um, I wasn't able to do that, by the way, but in line with what you've been saying about Mr. Morris and some other people, um, Frank Sinatra, when he died, I don't think he was quite that old. He had some illness, but he went to the University of California, Berkeley, I think, and he begged them, he said, I'll give you $5 million, any amount of money you want, just try any experiment on me that you have to give me some more time in life. So he probably didn't do it early enough. But the final question that perhaps you can respond to is, where in Europe do they seem to be more receptive to this kind of technology? And are they doing a lot like, like you're trying to do to uh, extend life, reverse aging, et cetera? Well, I believe they're more progressive in Asia than they are in Europe. There are a number of European centers that are trying to pioneer this. Uh, I think Jose could probably answer that more accurately than me. He travels all the time, and I don't. But nonetheless, there are technologies that are developing in certain parts of the world. And you're correct with Frank Sinatra. There was nothing really the doctors could do with all the money in the world. And just so you know, I, in the past, have been offered virtual blank checks from people to say, if you can figure out a way to reverse aging, just write any amount you need and take the money. I don't care about the money. And but back in those days, there was nothing I could recommend. It just didn't exist. The technology had not evolved far enough. Starting around the year 2014, we started to realize there's probably four to six ways that we can reverse biological aging in humans. And in the process, of course, probably eradicate whatever degenerative illness they have. So it's only been over the last three years that we can optimis opt optimistically talk about reversing biological aging in people. Uh, up until now, we've been trying to slow it down. Uh, people will use calorie restriction. They'll use certain hormone replacement therapies. There's a number of ways to reduce disease risk, slow aging, and, and partially reverse it. Uh, a woman who goes on uh, bioidentical hormones, uh, she's going to have a partial reversal of aging processes, just like a man will if he properly uses testosterone over a certain age. But these are very trivial reversals compared to what we're seeking to do with young plasma, specifically stem cell mobilized young plasma. We are not putting stem cells, by the way, into older people. That could be dangerous. Those stem cells could go into an older person's bone marrow and create their own immune system, which would then attack the older person's body. We are taking stem cell mobilized plasma, removing the stem cells, cryopreserving them. That's for the benefit of the young donor. And that's one of the incentives that the young donors have, by the way, to give up some of their stem cells because we're going to preserve those stem cells for their future use. Because it's very safe to put the young donor's stem cells back into the young donor. What we want is the plasma proteins. About 700 proteins exist in young people that start to dissipate when we get older. And when we get to a certain age, we don't have these proteins in our body anymore. What some of these proteins do, they facilitate DNA repair. They turn back on your own stem cells. They will repair all kinds of damage inflicted by the aging process. So our number one priority when it comes to age reversal research is to get these young people, and there's a group, by the way, recruiting people in Asia to donate their plasma so these projects can, can be done in a large-scale way, and that's encouraging, but I'm never going to let or rely on somebody else to do something that I may be able to do on my own, which is why I've been pushing for the last three years to accelerate technology that will be available here in South Florida and possibly over in Nassau, Bahamas, where people can get stem cell mobilized, young plasma infusions put into their body for the purpose of reversing their aging process.
Bill, is there a target age for those, for those young people? We want to get them, ideally, <laughs> we'd like to get them around 16 to 18. Uh, 18 might be legal in this country. We'll have to really fully evaluate that. But we'll probably be shooting for very healthy 21-year-old people who will uh, undergo a treatment uh, using a granulocyte colony stimulating factor drug. That's a drug used, by the way, on cancer patients, but when a healthy person takes it, it causes their bone marrow to produce huge numbers of stem cells, huge numbers of immune cells. And by injecting that drug for five days into a healthy young person, their stem cell counts go up very, very high. Then we put that young person through a process known as apheresis, where we will simply run their whole blood system through a machine about three times and remove the plasma, remove the stem cells, and then concentrate that into what we believe will be a rejuvenating serum to be infused into the bodies of elderly people. Now, in the beginning, that will be expensive because we need to get the young person and give them an expensive drug and put them through the apheresis. But once we see age reversal occur, well, then all we have to do is synthesize those proteins. And one protein, GDF11, they've already synthesized that. And there's a group of people who are using GDF11 right now to reverse their aging processes. They believe, anecdotally, that they are growing younger. And by three clinical measurements, they are growing younger with one out of the 700 proteins present in young people's bodies. So as Jose talked about, everything new is expensive. So using stem cell mobilized plasma from young donors in the beginning will be costly. Once we see it's reversing aging, the, the jump will be, well, let's synthesize those proteins so that everyone can afford them. So it becomes affordable to the entire population so that aging will no longer be a problem for the human race. One more question here. So, Dr. Mark Allen, um, I want to thank you for being a visionary and shining a light on all of this knowledge for everybody, not only here but around the world. It's really incredible. Um, I have a, a question about the way that you're doing this. Why, how did you choose to create a church instead of a, an association, a membership? There's other ways of disseminating information. Can you explain that choice and the benefits there? Yes, I can. I probably have founded over a dozen different charities to support all kinds of biomedical research projects. And I got to th thinking around the year 2012, what, what we're missing here is a congregation of like-minded people who can share information, who will get together once a month and, and, and just talk about their concepts, exchange ideas, and out of this church has emanated an incredible number of projects. People have talked to each other and have gone out and they started to initiate projects. So uh, I, I realized in 2012, people are living on their computers and it's a neat way to communicate. I mean, we prefer that way, but we're, we're missing the personal touch. And so I wanted to bring people together to hear speakers talk and then go downstairs and have a nice dinner and a relaxing atmosphere and feel free just to talk, exchange information and, and build on each other's knowledge base. So the, the purpose of this church was, was to get people to work together to accomplish the common goal of humanity, which is the abolition of illness, disease, aging and death. We're going to get rid of all those. And so that's what this church was founded on. The church is funded to exist in perpetuity. Anything I create, by the way, I try to make it last forever if I can. So it, this church should be here. Certainly the building, I think, will be here many, many hundreds of years in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Falloon. I'd like, to ex I'd like to expand on uh, Bill's answer there just a moment ago, because this is the Church of Perpetual Life, but it is not a Bible-based church. We are a science-based church. So we have, uh, we, we often call ourselves immortals, not because we have found immortality or have found the way to reverse the aging process, but because we have faith in future technology of humanity to do that, to solve this puzzle. And that's why we are a church. That's where our faith comes into play. And I appreciate uh, you asking that question, too. 
Um, you know, we have a, uh, our next event here will be March 23rd. March 23rd, we have Charlie Cam coming up to give his presentation, and we're really looking forward to that, Charlie. Uh, he came down tonight. You'll be able to meet with him as well as uh, discuss things with Jose Cordero uh, after, after the meeting here downstairs. But before we get underway, there's just one thing I'd like to do and uh, go over something that's, I think, very important, and that's aging versus age-related diseases. If you've ever tried to discuss the possibility of age reversal or advocate for the rejuvenation, uh, you know that it's hard to do. Often people deem that the idea is crazy or impossible or even dangerous. They say living too long could be boring or it could cause overpopulation or there could be terrible dictators that would become immortal and that sort of thing. But you've probably never heard anyone use the same arguments to say that we should not cure individual age-related diseases. And I think this is largely because people have little or no idea about what aging really is and how it cannot be untangled from the so-called age-related pathologies, which are simply the result of lifelong accumulations of several types of damages that are caused by the body's normal operations. Unlike infectious diseases, the disease of old age are not the result of pathogen attack, but essentially of your own body falling apart. People are largely unaware of this fact, and therefore they expect that diseases of aging could be cured by one by one without having to interfere with the aging process itself, as if the two weren't related at all. The result of this false expectation would be that you could cure Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or cancer, but somehow old people will still drop dead at the age of 80 just because they are old. And this is like saying that people died from being healthy. In reality, of course, this can't be done. To cure the diseases of old age, you need to cure aging itself. For whatever reason, if you think that curing aging is, as a whole would be a bad idea and that it should not be done, the only option is not to cure at least some of the root causes of aging. And consequently, some age-related pathologies would remain as untreatable as they are today. So the typical objections raised against a rejuvenation tend to sound reasonable at first. To some people, the statement, we should not cure aging because it would lead to overpopulation. It sounds self-evident. But if we consider the implications of the statement, the argument clearly becomes unacceptable. Not curing aging implies that curing some of its root causes, which in turn implies not curing some age-related diseases, Therefore, the sentence, we should not cure aging, implies we should not cure cancer or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. So let me reformulate this in a uh, fashion that would be the flip-flop. You may have heard, we should not cure aging because otherwise fewer people would die, and this might lead to overpopulation. Imagine if someone were to say, we should not cure Alzheimer's disease because otherwise this might lead to overpopulation because fewer people would die. No one would ever say that, would they? Or imagine if someone would say to you, we should not cure Parkinson's disease because if people were able to work much longer, then younger people wouldn't be able to find jobs. You would never hear that, would you? Some people say we should not cure aging because it would be unnatural. But what if they said, we should not cure arterial sclerosis because that would be unnatural. Doesn't make sense. Or we should not cure cancer because it would only be for the rich and that might cause inequality. You'd never hear that because that's awful and that's unacceptable. But people do say that about curing aging. Some people say we should not cure aging because longer lifespans would be boring. <laughs> and. Uh, Imagine if someone said, we should not cure cerebral vascular disease because longer lifespans would be boring. It's, so if, ever, if you ever uh, meet someone that gives you a reason why they think that you should not cure aging, turn that around, speak to the specific, and ask them if that would apply to cancer or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease and see what they have to say. And I'd like to thank our friends at SENS for the topic of this talk. You heard a couple of times the reference to the RAD Festival. In August, the second Revolution Against Aging and Death Festival will be, and you can get a discount by using the word perpetual 
If you go to our, our website or if you'd like information on that, please let me know. By the end of this month, you, there's a special discount by using the magic word perpetual. Revolution! Uh, revolution. <laughs> One quick question. How many people are here for the very first time tonight? You're here for the very first time. Holy cow. Bill, it's uh, about 60 people. Holy cow. Wonderful to have you. And I hope you'll join with us again. Thanks for coming to down downstairs. Our wonderful chef, Jackie, has prepared for you a feast of uh, some salmon or chicken and some other wonderful dishes. I hope that you'll stick around and have, engage us in conversation. We have a little uh, reception in Dr. Jose Carrera's honor. Thank you for coming tonight and look forward to meeting you personally. forever young. May the good Lord be with you down every road you roll. And may sunshine and happiness surround you when you're far from home. And may you grow to be proud, dignified and true. others as you'd have done to you. Be courageous and be brave, and in my heart you'll always stay forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young. May good fortune be with you, may your guiding light be strong. You'll just
Thank you, everybody. Woohoo! That's our theme song here at Church of Perpetual Life. Yay! Let me hear an amen. <laughs>